all members of the committee and members of the public to the meeting and remind members that some officers are joining us remotely and the meeting is being we are being broadcast live Jake. yeah okay we don't well, i know we had an issue last time didn't we so um, we are being broadcast live today so please use your microphones um, when speaking okay in the chamber go to agenda item one minutes of the last meeting of the adult social care and public health committee held on the 8th of november um, I'm asking for clarification of the minutes. Can that be agreed? We've all had a chance to read. Can that be? Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, apologies for absences, Joe, and substitution. Thank you. We just have uh, one apology today, which is Councillor Dr. Doddy, and he's being substituted by Councillor Barnfather. Thank you. And I'd like to welcome Councillor Barnfather to the meeting and I hope you find it enjoyable and educational. Agenda item three is a declaration of interest by members and officers. Do any members or officers present have any disclosable pecuniary interest to declare? And likewise, do any members or officers present have any private interests, either pecuniary or non pecuniary, to declare? If you do feel like you you have to declare something later on in the meeting, something comes to mind. Councillor Carr. I don't know whether I have to declare to not, but I am a, a steward volunteer at Vaccination Centre. What was that, Michelle? Do you want to put your mic on? I'm a volunteer at Vaccination Centre as well, so I, I don't know if I have to declare that, no. but seeing as Steve has, I thought I'd better. Okay, that's, good. that's fine. So we move on then to agenda item four. This is the, the fun part of the meeting. Uh, this is a lot of hard work gone into this and really, I'm, personally, I'm looking forward to it and looking forward to celebrating because I know how hard, and I'm sure you'll all join with me, how hard everyone, everyone has worked. So, so I'm very pleased to re present the report and celebrating success of departmental awards scheme in adult social care and public health. Um, there were five categories for nomination, those, uh, those categories being the best team, excellent in, excellence in working creatively, excellence in partnership working, excellence in leadership, and the last one, outstanding contribution. Staff were encouraged to nominate teams, services, or colleagues that they thought had been exceptional in supporting people services and other colleagues in the last year. The department received an excellent response and then judging, judging panel, which I was honored to be part of, had a difficult job scoring the shortlisted nominations and settling on a winner and two highly commended finalists in each category. We have invited the three top scoring nominees from each category to join today's meeting through Teams. We were going to do it in person. I do, and I was, Jenny put so much hard work in and Joe to how we're going to work the chamber, but unfortunately, the way things have turned out, we uh, so teams. So a very warm welcome to those that have been able to join us. We had hoped to have many more of you here in person, but following the government's announcement last last couple of days, we have changed our plans to meet the new guidelines. I hope that many more colleagues will be watching the live stream of this meeting too. Before we begin the presentations, I move the recommendations of the report on page eight of the agenda pack. Do I have a seconder? I'll second those, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Carlton. And please can I ask my fellow members to reserve any comments until all the presentations have been completed. I would like, therefore, to move to the announcement of our 2021 finalists and winners, starting with the award of the best team. Our first highly commended finalist is the approved mental health practitioner team, often known as the AMPS team. Throughout the pandemic, the team has provided the statutory service with no change to their ways of working. 
In the early stages of the pandemic, they were undertaking assessments, wearing full PPE and dealing with long-term periods of time, waiting for beds and ambulances for people in crisis. More recently, the team has set up a 24-hour model of service from scratch, which is showing a clear benefit to the people of Nottinghamshire. The nomination described a supportive and professional team where the workers have dealt with so much upheaval on both a personal and professional level, whilst maintaining the high standard of face-to-face -face frontline service throughout. So congratulations to John Bishop. Do we have them on? Jenny Martin, Julian Chi, and Maxine Case, who are joining us today to represent the team. The second highly commended finalist is the Countrywide Discharge to Ac Access Service. The Discharge to Access Service, which includes teams in South, Mid and North Knots, supports people being discharged from hospitals across the county. Over the last 12 months, this service has gone the extra mile under an unprecedented level of demand and pressure to ensure the best outcomes for people. The teams have had to rapidly adapt to changes in national gardens, new funding arrangements, changing processes, demands from partners, and an increased number of referrals. The nomination described the staff as excellent advocates for the people we work with and described how they worked hard to ensure that people are kept at the centre of everything we do. So well done to all the staff across the, these teams. I understand there are many colleagues from across the service joining us today. So it would be lovely to see you all on our big screen and send our congratulations out to all the teams. Well done. Thank you. Okay. So this means I'm very happy to announce that the winner of this category is the multi-agency safeguarding team. As we will discuss later in the safeguarding report, there has been a significant increase in adult safeguarding concerns and inquiries over the last few years Nottinghamshire has the highest number of concerns and inquiries in the East Midlands, an increase of 13% between 2019-20 and 2020-21, compared with 5% nationally. The nomination highly highlighted how the team has evolved in the last year, whilst dealing with unprecedented demand. The nomination describes how the pandemic provided opportunities to reflect and become creative in the service delivery. The team has taken on new responsibilities during the pandemic to free up the time of social care staff in district teams, with 17 team members, many of whom have never met face to face. The team is extremely strong and works together excellently. The nomination came from a social worker who joined the team recently, who said, personally, I've worked for a number of Sorry. a number of different local authorities over the last 30 years. I can genuinely say that this team has been my best experience. I understand that uh, Amanda Marsden, Catherine Lindley, Rebecca Summers, Abigail Davis and Lisa Trailing have joined us to, to represent the team. Are you on there? And there may, be, there may be other team colleagues too, so please put your cameras on and join your colleagues on the screen. Huge congratulations to the whole team on this award. I've got Mary Reid. Would you like to say? I just wanted to say congratulations. I was trying to do the clap emoji and I couldn't do it. So just congratulations to everybody. Amazing. 
Well done. Well done and congratulations. I think you deserve another round of applause here. I'm going to pop this award so I don't... Anyone else like to say anything? I think nope. That's it. Congratulations. Well done, Mash. Okay. I'm now going to hand over to Vice Chairman Councillor Scott Carlton to present the next award category. Councillor Carlton. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, the next category is the Excellence in Working Creativity. Our first highly commended finalist to be celebrated is the Care Home Response Hub. And we have Jane McKay and Julie Carby with us today. The work to develop a care home response hub that helped the department to be ready to deploy council staff to work in care homes in an emergency situation meant that we were ready to provide support to people in Nottinghamshire living in residential care settings if, if this care provision had broken down. Janine, Janine Vardy, Julie and Jane worked with our staff in a really considered and thoughtful way to plan for and establish the hub with risk assessments produced for all aspects of the work that they've been involved in. Well done to all of you involved in this excellent work. Our second finalist is the COVID Case Management System Team. COVID, COVID, COVID Visualised is a single secure database that holds information of all Nottinghamshire COVID-19 cases and their contacts. It is an online case management system developed, owned and managed by Nottinghamshire County Council, but co-developed with Nottingham City Council, which allows national NHS test and trace data to be combined with local contact tracing information and intelligence to support outbreak control measures. It was built as a web app that could be accessed by staff at the County Council, City Council and all the district and borough partners. The workflow notification services and reporting were all built during a short period of time following the agile uh, project management methodology and supported by daily meetings involving all the team members drawn from public health, the city, the county council's IT teams, colleagues from across the county council's chief executive department. The nomination described the ability for users to try out COVID, COVID as it was being developed, which meant that functions could be added or removed and the layout amended to be more user-friendly, which resulted in intuitive and data-rich system that is now the envy of neighbouring counties. John Wilcox, Emily Wormhall, Thomas Knowles, Peter Smith, Nathan Ruston, Rajiv Soni join us today to represent all the staff involved. My congratulations go to all of those involved in this innovative, innovative project created at PACE. This means our winner this year, and this is where I hope I've been handed the right envelope, is the Maximise Independent Service North Enablement Team. This team received four separate nominations in recognition for their outstanding work embedding strengths-based practice. The whole team, led by team manager Tanya Middleton, has risen to the challenge of strength-based thinking, developing approaches and thinking creatively to support people to maximise their independence in ways that suit the individual. There are numerous examples, including us supporting a person to purchase an electric bike to maximise their independence, helping people to access clubs and services in the community that would not traditionally be thought of, and using technological solutions to improve well-being and independence. The team's work has helped to encourage others to become, to become innovative sites, and the nomination illustrates how the staff are active campaigners of good practice, putting the person at the very heart of everything that they do. It is clear that you have had a really positive impact on the people that you work with. I understand Tanya, Sarah Williamson, Deborah Wilson and Alison Burgess are with us virtually today. So it is a huge well done from us all on this award to you and other colleagues that might have joined or are watching today. Thank you for that. And um, would anyone like to say a few words? I'll pop it 
Well done. And just like. I'd just like to say a very big thank you for this award. It means a, a, a huge amount to my team and um, we're very proud of the work that we've done. So thank you all. No, thank you once again. <laughs> I will now hand over to my fellow Vice Chairman, Councillor Nigel Turner, to pre present the next award. Thank you, Councillor Carl Carlton. It's my pleasure to introduce the Excellence in Partnership Working Award. Our first finalist is Sarah Craggs for her role in shaping our approach to co-production in the department. Sarah has always been dedicated to putting the people that we serve at the heart of what we do and over the last 18 months she has been reshaping the way in which we co-produce our services and strategies. Despite the challenges of COVID, social distancing, differing communication needs and different levels of IT literacy, Sarah has managed to progress this work to support the development of a whole new model for working with our voice, a group of people and careers, and sorry, and carers with live lived experience. Well done, Sarah, to the co-production group on your significant progress. <laughs> Next up is the Children's in Integrated Commissioning Hub based in our public health service. The team acts as a system leader and single point of coordination for the commissioning of health and wellbeing services for children and young people across Nottinghamshire. Over the last year, while supporting the COVID-19 response, with many members shifting focus and capacity, the hub has continued to demonstrate excellence in partnership working to improve outcomes for children and young people. This has been especially challenging with the virtual environment, but the best team have embraced, but the team have embraced technology to enable partnership to work, work to progress. The production of the best start strategy and the mobilization of mental health support teams with local schools praised following a ministerial visit are just a couple of their achievements in the last year. Representing the hub today are Kerry Ann Adams, Catherine Brown. Can congratulations to you. So this means our award winner is the team that came together to work on housing and homelessness throughout the, the pandemic. The nomination highlighted how these colleagues came together and made a tangible difference to lives of some of our most marginalised and deprived residents, including rough sleepers, vulnerably housed people and those released from prison with no fixed abode. They did this through working tirelessly with huge range of internal and external partners putting the individual in need at the centre of their approach and securing wraparound support from across services. This work managed and mitigated the risk of COVID transmission with the rust sleeping and homeless population and was often done at extremely short notice, usually needing to get, get same day housing and support in place. This team did not exist prior to the pandemic and the nomination describes how successful the partnership working was Rarely were they unable to get full support in any place for any individual that needed it. So huge con congratulations to all colleagues involved in this work. I think Nick Romilly, Jenny French, Eleanor Headley, Prayesh Gohill, Tristan Snowden Powell, Poole, Poole, sorry, Sarah Quilty have joined us today by teams. Well done on your excellent work. Is there anybody wants to wants a, a word? Yes, please. I'd just like to say thank you to everyone for the hard work they've put in, and thanks to members and adult social care and public health team to acknowledge this work. It's been a tremendous amount of effort put in, and the final part I'd like to say is just to thank all the team's families because I know they have worked over above and beyond, sometimes late into the evening and interrupting other aspects of life. They've really prioritised this vulnerable group over the last 18 months and I really want to say well done guys you've done a great job thank you Nick Amazing. Well done. and I will now hand over to Councillor Elliot to award the final two thank you thank you Councillor Turner 
Our penultimate award is for excellence in leadership. Our first finalist is Louise Lester, consultant in public health. Louise has been central to the leadership of public health response to COVID-19. She has led tirelessly for 18 months on PPE supply, outbreak management, advice and guidance to stakeholders, media engagement and vaccination, as well as many other areas. She has found inno innovative solutions to a myriad of problems and acted as an inspiration to her team. Her nomination said, the COVID-19 response would most certainly not have been as proficient and successful if she had not been at the helm. Congratulations to Louise on her excellent leadership throughout this very challenging time. Well done. Our second highly commended finalist is Stuart Sale, Group Manager for the Maximising Independence Service. Since the creation of, of the Maximising Independence Service, Stuart has championed the vision, service, offer and achievements of the service across the department and beyond, and encouraged everyone in his team to do so too. Over the last year, Stuart has remained calm and never lost sight of the task in hand. His nomination describes how he recognises and values the staff and his team, has time for them and puts the people that we support at the heart of what we do and describes the natural, true, value-based leadership qualities displayed by Stuart. Well done, Stuart, on your supportive and inspiring approach to leadership. Congratulations. On to our winner in this category. Gemma Shelton, Group Manager for Quality and Market Management. All right, Gemma. Gemma received two nominations in this category and her team was nominated across several other categories. Such has been their contribution and impact over the last year. Gemma and her team have been at the heart of the department's response to the pandemic. Gemma has worked tirelessly with care homes and home care providers to support them and ensure they are safe, to help them understand the changing legislation and to ensure they had PPE in place. Gemma has played a key role in the local resilience forum, chairing the partnership-based care home and home care cell meetings and bringing partners together to work collaboratively. Throughout this, Gemma has always been there for her team and has led and supported them through significant change during a challenging time, including adapting to seven day working and working much more closely with colleagues across the health and social care system. One of her nominations described how people respect her and have confidence in her approach. She is warm and has a great sense of humor and always has a positive outlook. Talking about you, Gemma. She is an inspiring manager and is truly respected by her team and others. Huge congratulations to Gemma on this award. And that brings us to the... <laughs> well done. I've got to do that one. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, Gemma, never short of a word, are you? So. No, I just want to say thank you, and I, and I really couldn't have done it without my team. My team have been fantastic and continue to be fantastic, so thank you very much. It's amazing. No, thank you. Congratulations. <laughs> and that brings us to our final award, which is for Outstanding Contribution. The first highly commended finalist is occupational therapist Jennifer Carter, who is based in Living Well Services in Newark. Jenny is described as the embodiment of the sort of professional you'd want to visit your own loved ones in a time of need. Her nomination describes her tenacity in pursuit of achieving the best outcomes for the people she works with. Evidence when she successfully pursued 
a disabled facilities grant for a second vertical lift for a woman living in a three-storey house. The individual was able to continue to fulfil her parenting role in a way that was meaningful and important to her. Jenny's team is one of the innovation sites for strengths-based practice, and Jenny has taken the lead in terms of the OT intervention. All of her colleagues have reported how much they have valued her input and how much they have learnt about what OT has to offer. Well done, Jenny. Thank you. Thank you. Our second finalist is Jane Machen, who is also an occupational therapist based in the Aging Well Ashfield North team. Jane received five nominations from her colleagues and was nominated for consistently going above and beyond the call of duty every day to support the people of Ashfield and Mansfield. Jane has many years of service to her name and the nominations highlight how many people have benefited from her caring and knowledgeable approach to her work. She is described as an unsung hero and someone that is an inspiration to work with. Many congratulations go to you, Jane. You are obviously hugely valued by the people you work with, and congratulations. Thank you. And our final winner <coughs> of the afternoon is Mary Reed, principal social worker for her absolute focus on practice, quality and well-being through the pandemic. Supporting the department at all levels, Mary has been a key leader throughout the pandemic and provided a vital link between the management team and the workforce to ensure we manage risk effectively whilst driving social care practice. Mary has also led our work on race equality facilitating work that has been difficult to get traction in and supporting the implementation of the pilot to implement the workforce race equality standard. Our work on strength-based approaches and the innovation sites has been a feature of several of today's nominations and awards, and it is crucial to us finding a way forward through our recovery from COVID. This work has required strong leadership to keep a tired workforce motivated and feeling able to be innovative, which Mary has delivered. Mary constantly models social justice and social care values and positivity on the huge challenge. Many congratulations to you, Mary, on this well-deserved award. So, Mary, the floor's all yours. <laughs> I just want to say thank you very much, and I couldn't have done it without our staff. Our staff are amazing, inspirational, and keep my passion going absolutely every day. So, absolutely all credit to them, really. But thank you so much for this. It's really appreciated. Thank you. <laughs> so... Huge congratulations to all our finalists and winners today. On behalf of the committee, I would like to thank you for your amazing work, which has been recognised by your colleagues and which I know will continue over a challenging winter time. We will endeavour to get the awards to our winners as soon as possible. Congratulations. I would also like to take this opportunity to congratulate all those that were nominated for these awards for your achievements over the last year and we look forward to next year's awards. And I'll open it up for any comments from the floor. I take Councillor Henshaw. Um, thanks, Chair, for bringing me in. Um, it's, it's appropriate that the awards are um, shaped in the form of a star, because I think uh, each and every one of the nominees and winners today are, are stars in their own right. Um, in, in the future, when the history of uh, this COVID 
pandemic will be written, they won't be talking about people having Christmas parties and virtual quizzes. They'll be talking about the work that our, our staff have, have put in over the difficult period. And uh, they are exemplary in the way that they forward the values of people that work in local government and social services and from our group's um, point of view and we'd just like to say thank you all very much for what you've done and what you will continue to do thank you thank you councillor uh, martin yeah thank you chair um i think it's a testament like councillor anshaw says to all our great staff all of our staff are great whether they've won an award or not They've all gone beyond, above and beyond the call of duty, especially during COVID. And I would especially like to thank them on behalf of all the people that they've looked after. Whether you took a star home or not, you're all winners. Thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Carr. Uh, just really to say congratulations to everybody. Um, quietly get on with the job, um, going over and above. And uh, we're very, very grateful, as are the people of Nottinghamshire. Councillor Barnfather. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Um, an organisation is only as good as, uh, as the people that it employs to do the work on our behalf. And uh, I think uh, this type of awards that we're seeing today is an opportunity for us to highlight and showcase the sort of work that is done and the type of people that we employ in this organisation. I'm very proud of Nottinghamshire County Council. I'm very proud of the staff that we employ. And I think the, uh, the evidence that we've seen today is testimony to, uh, to that. So thank you to all of you. Thank you. Any officers would like to make any comments? Jonathan, of course. Thank you. Yeah, just to say how proud I am of, um, of well, the wider team and public health colleagues in particular, some of the things that we've heard about today. Um, making a real difference to outcomes for, for people in Nottinghamshire. And I'm, I'm really thrilled. Thank you. Thank you. Your name? Melanie, my corporate director. Yeah, so all the colleagues on the call and those that were nominated, the winners and, and the um, runners-up, I'm so proud of you all. You've done an amazing job in the last um, year. You've modelled excellence and hard work, and I really appreciate it, so thank you. Thank you. I'd, I'd just like to echo... All those comments made in the chamber it is a testament and just to celebrate all of our officers and all of our staff's amazing hard work and commitment just to making nottinghamshire the amazing place it is to live and just get those positive outcomes brilliant okay thank you um after that we still have to move to the vote on the recommendations set out in the report so we're going to have a show of hands all those in favor unanimous thank you it's carried okay agenda item five it's the report of the corporate director um, for the adult social care and health the report sets out the department's current financial and performance position the department is facing unprecedented demand and high levels of risk and, esca and escalation and the report shows how this is affecting not only the department's performance, but also the social care market. Mitigation plans are in place to reduce pressures and manage mitigations. However, capacity and demand challenges are likely to continue well into 2022-23. In terms of positive contributions to performance, there have been changes and new initiatives in mental health services, including the implementation of the 24 seven day week approved mental health practitioner service and the report highlights the impact of these there is also an update on the number of digital bids and progress on work underway with partners which support the department's aim on responding and supporting people through digital means and sharing information with health partners i move the re recommendations to the report as set out on page six do i have a seconder i'll second chairman and reserve the right to speak Thank you. 
So, committee, I intend to be quite brief, although myself and um, Kashif will be um, willing to answer any questions. So, there's just two main points to highlight, really. So, the first is that we have an underlying underspend as set out in paragraph six. So, that is because we're unable currently to um, recruit to vacant roles, which is the main driver for that underspend. The second thing I wanted to highlight is clearly our performance is, is radically impacted by the fact we remain um, under the influences of the pandemic and an emergency crisis response. And indeed, this week, we're further suspending business as usual work to focus on um, providing critical services to people. So this is impacting on our performance right across the performance pack in the yellow pages. But we're, what we have tried to represent in, in the um, report is a flavour now of some of those steps that we put in place to try and recover that performance, because essentially our performance is assessing what is good care. So it's still a priority for us um, to be do doing that. But that's all I wanted to really comment on. Um, committee at this point, but like I say, happy for myself or Kashif to answer some specific questions on the narrative. Kash, you want to add anything before I open it? No, you're happy. Just take questions. Okay, I've got I've got Councillor Martins indicated. So, yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, one thing I would like to put forward before I discuss this report is the fact that I think we need to get Anthony May to talk to the government about face-to-face -face meetings in a pandemic. Uh, when we've moved into this uh, sort of quasi lockdown kind of thing, I think we ought to be clear. This is a public health meeting where we're talking about public health issues, and yet here we are contravening most of what the government is trying to reintroduce. That's just a point, anyway. Okay. So, right, moving to the. To um, you got a question? Yeah. Okay. So, um, on on the um, underspend. We're supposed to be, you know, the, the assessed savings of um, 4.51 million. 1.58 of these are supposed to, are expected to slip into the next two years. Is is that because we haven't been able to deliver services, or because of we've got more money? You know, we haven't paid staff, or we haven't got staff. We're not recruiting staff because we seem to have a real big issue about recruiting staff through quite a few of the papers in this afternoon's committee. Do you, do you foresee that getting any better or, or is that going to continue? Because um, after the 55 that we agreed, we've only employed 21 in one and out of the other 55, we've only employed 13. So ha are we going to move to agency work sooner rather than later to fill the gap because the pressure's on you must be huge because you've just not got enough people to do the job? Okay, thank you, Chair. Melanie. Um, so, uh, unfortunately, the, the social care workforce crisis is as much about our internal registered um, professionals and other supporting staff, um, public health colleagues, OT, social workers, um, community care officers, whether age, people are agency or interim or employed. So there's a shortage of whatever type of professional it is and their availability in the market. So, that, so um, our ability to recruit, I think, is going to be very challenging going forward. We have more success at some roles than others. So um, that we've had good success, for example, in, in recruiting to the COVID response team. We've had some good success at recruiting to the reablement service, but we're not able to recruit the volumes that we need to meet the current increases in demand because people need uh, more support this year than they did last year. So um, I'm not optimistic about our ability to do that. The, the save, you asked about the savings. The savings d does relate to development work, which we're unable to prioritise at the moment, hence the, the moving the benefit realisation into the success, subsequent years. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Any, Councillor Henshaw? Yeah, th thanks uh, for that, uh, Melanie. Uh, in relation to the underspend, obviously it causes um, the committee great concerns and obviously we totally understand the reasons uh, why that's occurred it's uh, a challenging uh, period to say the least for for us uh, but in relation to I and mean, there's a continued theme and you, you've touched on it uh, in relation to the uh, continuing in difficulty in in recruitment and in recruiting uh, staff uh, in relation to um, I think you mentioned it uh, in relation to the 55 FTEs that we originally said we were going to regroup we would only managed to do 21 and 
obviously there's, there's a problem, and, and I know there's a national problem, and it's not just affecting Nottinghamshire, but it, it, it's we're here to look at what's happening in Nottinghamshire and how we can best mitigate that problem. Uh, is there anything, Chair, we can do to make sure that our work, uh, our staff are more, the things are more attractive to, to get people to come to us? Um, you know, whether it's terms and conditions or workloads or home life balance or whatever it is, is there anything that we can do? Because I think uh, if we don't do something, this problem will be just continually exacerbated. And uh, it, it's, it seems to me that it's only going to get worse. Um, so basically what I'm asking, Chair, is uh, can, you, can you facilitate ways through us of making working for Nottinghamshire County Council um, more attractive so that we can try and mitigate the, the issues. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Henshaw. We are, we are looking at recruitment and retention, incentivising services, but cash can go into more detail for you now. Okay? Yeah. So, yeah, in terms of workforce, I think... Um, Unfortunately, there isn't a, a silver bullet or magic one to resolve the workforce shortage. It is um, re really challenging across the board, in particular around uh, uh, qualified staff in terms of social work, OTs, occupational therapists, and community care officers. I think in the report, um, I think we aim to recruit 55. Actually, 21 were recruited. That's pretty good going in the, in the, in, in the context of where there's huge shortages. I think regionally, um, other authorities have struggled to get anywhere near that, that kind of number that we've, we've done pretty well in that sense. However, I think it's going to require a long-term strategic plan around workforce. And so we are looking at apprenticeships, investment in our three, you know, uh, long-term apprenticeship development program. Uh, and also, uh, we're also wanting to have more conversations and partnerships with universities, because the reality is that we need to see a much more greater increase uh, of people being coming through uh, the pipeline in terms of qualified staff. And because of the demand um, currently is uh, so high, we, we do need to increase all, all uh, mechanisms that we've got around recruitment. So it is really challenging. We are exhausting all our, all our other options. Uh, in particular, in the short term, it's more around agency staff uh, that we are um, utilising but it will take a, a much more longer term strategic plan. And then also uh, we are working with our ICS partners, so um, particularly health partners around how can we join, to, join up some of our recruitment and retention initiatives as well. Councillor Welsh. Um, yes, um, I have a question with regards to mandatory vaccinations. Um, in care homes and how that is going to impact going forward. So for example, the last statistics from Nottinghamshire County Council, and it may have been updated, is 1,500 residential care staff hadn't had the vaccination and 3,000 unvaccinated within home care. That's quite a significant um, amount of um, people. Um, and I was just wondering where we were with regard to that, because if that figure stays the same, when the government expectations come in, that's going to obviously put a further strain on services. So it's a real genuine um, question with regards to um, yep. with okay. regards to that. So have you got another? Yeah, um, and then my um, other question is something perhaps you've all thought about, and if we've had the new announcement by Boris Johnson last night where we're limiting the amount of people that can go into care homes, there's obviously that di direct threat again, isn't there, with regards to the virus entering the care homes and staff perhaps um, becoming ill, that's going to have a further impact as well. I understand we're in quite a precarious position anyway, and while I understand the absolute need for a long-term strategy, I think there's a more imminent situation going on and we'd just like some clarity with regards to okay. that as well. What, what we do, because they're not, you're good questions, but they're not in the body of the paper. So with the mandatory vaccinations, we, we've been discussing this. Um, we will give, we're happy to give you a briefing outside of the 
meeting and we'll get that information forwarded to you about what we're doing. Okay. Um, with your second question, Cash, if you want to pick that bit up about numbers going into care homes or more and more. Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, again, I think uh, the guidance, we will be following the guide, national guidance on visitor policy. We'll be, uh, at the moment, the quality market management team are in daily contact um, with um, providers, with care providers, and um, due to the current level of risk and escalation, we're also now holding weekly calls this from this week uh, with providers in terms of what more can we do to support Around, um, around the current pressures. Um, so we'll be working through all, um, all of those actions around vaccination, around outbreaks, uh, but also um, any challenges around workforce, what more can we do? Uh, there are some imminent uh, actions that we are taking. So for example, through our risk uh, management um, discussions and meetings, we've, we've got a four week plan, which actually begins to look at the volunteering, looks at redeployment of staff, so, um, for example, I have uh, in, in my service improvement team, I have uh, qualified staff that are not in the front line. So we have already made the decision to redeploy staff at the front line services. So to support some of the short term uh, challenges we've got at the moment. Okay. Thank you, Cash. Any more questions? No. Okay, with that briefing, we'll get to you. We can copy all members in on that. Um, we'll now move to the vote take a vote on the recommendations that have been moved and seconded. All those in favour? Thank you. That's unanimous. Right, agenda item six. It's the winter planning and national hospital discharge policy. For the second year, the Department of Health and Social Care have issued specific requirements for social care to fulfil in the form of a national winter plan. There are a number of requirements for the department to complete working with our social care providers and also areas that we need to deliver through working with our health partners. This report sets out the many strands of work that the department has undertaken with partners to implement the national discharge policy, supporting people to return home as soon as possible after a stay in hospital and also to avoid admission. It covers risks this work faces due to the current national temporary funding ceasing and difficulties recruiting and retaining frontline care staff. Along with an overview of the actions taken to the date to address these. One of the winter plan requirements is to plan for the anticipated increase in demand for care that we see each winter. As part of this approval is sought to create additional temporary posts over the winter in the council's own reablement service. I move the recommendations as set out on page four of the report and ask for a seconder. I'll second our chairman and reserve the right to speak. Thank you. I'll hand over to Ainsley. Sue, sorry. Thank you, Chair. So, you look worried then. <laughs> so the context for this report is that in November, the Department of Health did publicise its, uh, it, its second national social care winter plan. And there's an appendix at the end of the report that just um, uh, plan on the page with a bit of an overview about that. There's two main elements of the winter plan. One is which the government sets out uh, national funding support that's available till the end of March. Uh, for the local authority and to use with its provider market. And that includes things like the temporary workforce grant, which is helping with some of the recruitment issues that we've been talking about. There's some funding to support discharge from hospital. And there's things like um, free PPE, for example, till the end of March. And then the rest is actions for local authorities to take with their partners. And they've uh, broken it down into four key areas. One is preventing and controlling uh, spread of outbreaks in care, uh, care settings. The second one is to make sure there's good collaboration and risk escalation uh, between the local authority, social care and partners. The third bit is around support to paid and unpaid carers, so uh, both family carers and, the, and our own workforce, as well as provider workforce. And um, the final bit is just generally supporting 
the market, that all those providers that are out there, and trying to stabilise um, the issues that we've been hearing about with recruitment and retention difficulties. So we do have a departmental plan in place, um, as well as a winter plan in place with our partners to mitigate the fact that we've got increasing demand um, and less capacity in services. Um, and that work includes how we'll mutually support each other um, across all community services, as well as um, at the interface with hospitals. Um, it, even with all those plans, we do have still have significant risks in terms of the market and providers who are struggling sometimes. So if they have outbreaks, for example, of illness in their services, um, then, then we need to step in and support them. We don't quite know what the size of that is. So our plans are very flexible and able to sort of uh, ratchet them up and down. The workforce pressures and COVID infection rates are obviously variables as part of that. Um, as well as planning for winter, we're also planning uh, to be how we can sustain the new hospital discharge model from April onwards and manage the projected 23.7 increase in demand. There is a, financial, a potential financial risk to the council um, because of the gap in the funding for social care of implementing the new model um, when the national funding for discharge support ends in March. So we're working really closely with our systems partners at a senior level to, to share the risks of that across the system, but with no guarantees as of yet that funding will, will flow into social care but once that works complete we'll bring a further report back to committee in the new year um, and i just wanted to flag up there is a there is a case study about our reablement service part of the ask is to um, is to approve some temporary posts it's a great service um, it helps people get back on their feet after they've been unwell, often after a stay in hospital, get their independence and confidence back. So that's great for people, but it also uh, reduces reliance on our services. And at the current time when care is in such short, short supply, it's a really excellent uh, service to invest in. So I'm happy to take any uh, questions. Thank you, Sue, for that. I think, yeah, it's, it's much needed. It's, it's part of our count. County Council plan the the miss service is amazing keeping people maximizing independence keeping in their own homes we'll open up to questions who Councillor Carr thank you thank you chair um, I think uh, I think uh, Councillor Martin's um, point uh, was uh, overlooked a little bit, and I think it's pertinent that I've been, I'd walked around the offices this lunchtime, and there's virtually nobody in, which is right. Uh, the government have asked us to work from home if you can. Well, actually, we can work from home, but we can't because the government haven't changed again the law that says that councillors have to be in person to make decisions rather than on meetings. I think that's that's very, very you know, I think that's a, a criticism that needs to be addressed. Um, secondly, I, I am very concerned uh, as our officers about the inability to be able to recruit people, especially now as it was announced after the Strictly come dancing final last night by the Prime Minister that the, the vaccination is going to be bought for to three weeks, which is going to put a lot of strain on getting people to deliver the vaccine. So yet again, that's possibly people who we could have recruited to, to do this. I'm not saying that it's wrong. I'm just saying that it was done without warning. You've got questions, do you? Yeah, I, I don't have to ask a question. I can make a statement. I'm, I'm go, I shall be asking a question. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, I don't know whether you're aware that people were arriving this morning at the Forest Walking Centre asking for booster jabs, walking in, to be told, no, we can't do that now, you have to book an appointment. Are you aware also that the, the mobile vaccine bus, which was due to be at uh, the village in Councillor Kerry's division last Saturday morning, had to be cancelled because there was nobody to man it? We, we are in a serious, serious situation with regards to staffing for all of this. And I, I cannot see what 
what's going to happen. What I am worried about what might happen is what happened last year in the rush to get people out of hospital. And I am acutely aware that our officers uh, will have learnt from that experience. And I just need some um, clarification as what will happen if we can't recruit these people? What pressures will that put us under? Okay, so positively, our, our council's own reablement service is recruiting and retaining staff. So that's why we've got a steady rolling program now of just continuous people coming in. But there's very few vacancies. Um, and I'm sure that, you know, that, that rates of pay, et cetera, are part of it. But um, the team, the staff all tell me uh, that uh, actually they really feel like they're making a difference and they're well supported. So we know the sorts of things that attract people into the sector. So as Cash said, there's a whole raft of work happening with our providers to see how we can uh, share that out and, and how we can start to improve. There is no real answer other than making sure that we turn it around and make social care attractive for people to come into again. Um, and uh, to start to target um, other sectors. So rather than moving people, moving people around health and social care, we need to start to target young people through schools, maybe areas we haven't tapped in. continue to learn as we go through COVID, but I think the, the way we managed discharges last, last year was, was really positive. Um, and certainly we didn't have some of the issues in care homes locally that other areas had on the scale because we were very involved in that. Um, so this, we, we do place people if, the, if, based on an individual assessment, we will sometimes place people in residential care, um, but we make sure that that's done on their best interests and also in a way that complies with all the COVID regulations and infection control. Thank you. Councillor Henshaw. Yeah, thank, thanks, uh, Boyd, for that. Um, in relation to the report, thank, thank you for presenting it today. Obviously, um, um, we've touched on recruitment and the difficulty of recruiting in, 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 in previous agenda items. In relation to the, um, the posts that are outlined, do, do you think or uh, do you think we should actually make the positions uh, rather than temporary, make, make them more, uh, more permanent because that might be more of an um, uh, incentive for somebody to come to work for us? And uh, obviously we all know, and I think everybody in this uh, committee knows that uh, the, b the best way to recover from a hospital um, uh, admitting, being admitted to hospital is obviously trying to get home as quickly as possible to your own house with your own family and, and friends around you and that does aid a quicker recovery. And the other side to that is if we can prevent people going into hospital as well, it's more beneficial to those as individuals. Um, uh, my question is in relation, well, question in relation to Power 13 in relation to the National Temporary Fund. Um, can you, Boyd, indicate to us how much, uh, it may be in the report and I've missed it, uh, how much we're actually applying for and how much we'll get? And do you think if, if whatever we get, it will mitigate the problems? Because uh, uh, obviously there are people waiting in, in hospitals and it may not be a large percentage of people that are actually going to be discharged to our sort of care through our, our care packages, but there, there may be a, a number of people that actually can't be, or do you think there are people that can't be discharged because we can't provide the backup support and staff to help them 
once they have been discharged because obviously that that is another another problem if people when they get through the discharge procedure in hospital which is very often a hierarchy and sometimes our people come in to actually participate in the in the discharge policy and and they tend to ar well, not argue but would argue the case that yeah people need to come home and uh, we need to look after them as, as best we can but if we haven't got our staff actually able to go then we, we're going to be struggling so that's that's another one of my questions chair so uh, in relation to this yeah we agree with the report but we have our concerns that the, the, even if we recruit these uh, people on a temporary basis, the, the, we'll still have a major problem. Thank you. So um, we are working with partners to look at what we need permanently, because um, whilst I'm confident we'll recruit people temporarily, because it is a frontline job, there's a trap people that might want to give it a go and don't know if they like it. Uh, but we're working with our partners to look at how we, um, uh, what we need to make permanent from all, from all the temporary posts and various services that we've got with this temporary discharge money from the government. So that's um, why we, we will come back early in the new year when, we, when those discussions are concluded. Councillor Welsh. Um, sorry, my glasses steamed up then. Um, thank you. Um, a few questions with regards to this. Um, put my glasses on so I can actually see it. Um, so the first question is, how many contracted hours have we had handed back to us because companies aren't able to fulfil their needs so far? And is something, this something, this is, and this is to do with winter planning, um, and is this something that is a worry going forward. That's my first um, question. The other question is, how long are people waiting for daycare packages currently? Um, and is that having a detrimental effect on people's health and well-being that are waiting for longer than what they should um, be doing? And I was quite surprised when I received a couple of phone calls last week where they said, it's not unusual for them to receive a phone call on Friday to say there's no care at the weekend available for their father or their mother. Two different people, one was a father, one was their mother-in-law. Um, and could they fulfill that gap during the weekend? Um, which is all very well if you're able to, but that's not always um, an issue. And I wondered to what level that was um, going on because that was two people in Gedlin and I was wondering whether that was going on um, else elsewhere and then the um last but definitely not um least is with regards to home care and the capacity and i know that it was touched on briefly but i think perhaps we need to talk about it a bit more i understand an email went out to every staff member in adult social care and ash um with the heading of an emergency to say that there was a severe problem in the south of Nottinghamshire with regards to home care in the next couple of weeks and could ple people please stop, step up and volunteer with regards to that. Now I think that's probably something as a committee we should know about and perhaps even the leaders or maybe the lead spokesperson should be briefed about. So what is the actual situation in the south of Nottinghamshire? How many care home care hours do we actually need? Um, because for me, I've, I've never heard of that before. And when I've spoke to colleagues in other local authorities, they haven't heard of that before. This is unprecedented that we're having to email all of our workers to say there's a home care crisis in, in Rushcliffe, well, south of Nottinghamshire, as you've called it. So what is the situation? How many hours? How many home care workers? In? And if it's happening there, is there an issue in the rest of the county and how will that actually okay. be dealt with? Thank you. Before I hand over to me, the, the contracted hours handed back are not in the public domain, so I'm going to pass over to Melanie now. So where, where we discuss as, as a committee the pressures in the adult social care market is in the 
market position statement report. So last committee heard that, and there are two parts of that report. One is in the public domain, one is in the exempted part of the meeting. And the exempted part of the meeting is where we describe the, the providers that have um, experienced provider failures or quality concerns. So that's, the, that's where that gets discussed in committee, which isn't on today's agenda. Um, in terms of our operational um, planning as a council, we've been in emergency planning procedures now for 18, well, actually it's coming up for two years. We started planning in February um, for the pandemic. And so it has, it's been quite typical through that period to be looking at redeploying staff. I reported earlier about how we've had to stand down some certain activities. So we do that. That is part of that operational planning consideration. The briefings for that take place either in the chair's briefings or in the opposition briefings. That isn't something that, that we've been bringing through committee. We reference those pressures in the adult social care performance report. But we haven't been briefed about the south of Nottinghamshire situation, have we? Unless you have, and then the opposition or hasn't. There is a situation in Rushcliffe where we've got a real serious situation. This isn't bad, this is a serious situation. We've not got enough people to deliver the home care in the south of Nottinghamshire. It says very clearly in this email to the staff of this county council. So. Uh, I don't understand why that's not in the public's interest for us to have some clarity on what actually is the severity of that situation. And is this a situation that is going to be replicated, for example, in my ward in, in Gedlin? I mean, as I said, it's unprecedented. I've never known it. If you've been doing it on a regular basis, sending those emails out about, I've never known that before. And the people that I've spoken to haven't known it before. So I'm just wondering what that situation was because um, redeploying people that might have another job isn't always the answer either because who does their job while they're being redeployed on the front line? Uh, this is a serious situation. And I do think that, you know, we had a briefing last week. This wasn't mentioned to us last week um, and it's still not been mentioned to us since and I, would, I think as a committee whether it's in this meeting or out of the meeting we really need to know what this severity is and what is actually actually happening because if I had parents in the south of Nottinghamshire and I heard about this I'd be very worried. So, so I, I just just to um, re repeat that the way that we brief members about our risk management is through those briefings we haven't got a re report on the agenda today looking at that level of risk and issue i think we've been quite open um through briefings and in committee that we are that we have pre pressures in the workforce we're struggling to meet some of our um support requirements so but, but we haven't got today prepared a briefing for committee talking about that Councillor Kerry. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, I'd like to talk about uh, this report. Um, firstly, to recognise that uh, Nottinghamshire, over many years, in my, my memory from when I've been a, a councillor in here um, and away and then back again, is that we've been innovative and proactive uh, in our work in, in the community in terms of discharge renewable that kind of stuff so i recognize that and, and we've celebrated a lot of that hard work earlier on today and would like to just uh, you know give my thanks again for that um so the reality of this is yes there may be some issues that, we, that you look at risk you look at those issues your prioritization all those kind of things how well are we doing now and how well do we compare to other authorities in this situation please Yes, yeah, so um, the way that we, the performance indicator for that changed with the new hospital discharge. So colleagues will be familiar that when it was filled, what was called detox, late transfer of care, we, uh, we came out in the sort of top 12 of local authorities on a routine basis for quite some time and had very few delays in our hospitals. Um, so the, the, the way that we, we, we operate in the hospitals and how that's counted has changed. But um, as the report says, we are still doing quite well, considering that we haven't yet remodelled all our workforce. 
around the new hospital policy. That came in in an emergency in March 20. It's on its third or fourth iteration. So it keeps getting tw tweaked slightly. So we've got, uh, we've just had the local government association do a peer review to help us right size everything and get that working as, as well and as streamlined as possible. But um, as the report says, I think given the challenges that we're facing, of, uh, of, of challenges with uh, keeping our own social work staff in those, in those, um, doing the discharges and also um, in the care sector. 27% of people that we worked, worked with in that first week in November went home on the day they were well enough or the day after. And that's what we aim to do is get people home as, as soon as they can. But um, there's, there's issues about the streamlining the process so that we get we can plan better and there's issues in the care sector so um, I think we're, we're held in our own we're probably we're doing better than other local authorities and we do use we will use interim residential care placements um, to to make sure that people aren't staying in hospital longer than they need to where that's appropriate and not all other local authorities do that Thank you. yeah thank you chair I mean, I think it's very, very important. I mean, these roles that we look at here, uh, reablement workers, senior reablement workers, reablement manager, okay, occupational therapists, community care officers, they're all vastly important roles. And it, there are four papers in this whole agenda today that are all struggling with the same uh, issue, and that's recruitment. And I, I, I do think somehow, we may need to look at this in a different way and think outside the box and probably use, I don't know whether it's possible, it's a shame Jonathan Gribbin's gone because we probably potentially could use some of the public health grant to enter into some kind of contractual bursary agreement with some universities or something like that because we need, we need staff, we clearly need staff and, and Sue and Ainsley are doing the best and, and Mel, you're all doing the best and like we, we said earlier in the awards, you know, there, everybody's going out the extra mile, but we just simply haven't got enough people to fill the posts. I mean, there must be over 200 jobs floating around in these four papers. So we definitely need to do something outside the box. And I, I think prob probably ought to be part of the new ICS uh, agreement or arrangements or something that needs talking about it's a subject that really needs bringing up to the top because we are struggling in every area of so adult health and social care to recruit people and to retain staff thank you chair so just to provide assurance we are working uh, there is a workforce program in the ics and we're working jointly with partners on this issue thank you Councillor, did you want to make a point for Councillor Anshul? Yeah, uh, thanks, Chair. I mean, obviously, we, we digress slightly from the, the report. I think that we all accept is uh, a report that's got its, got its challenges, but nevertheless, we need to uh, support the recommendations. The, the, you know, the, 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 the sort of thing that we've sort of moved into in relation to the point raised by Councillor Welsh and sort of I touched on in my question about uh, uh, whether or not there were any people in, um, in, in hospitals that weren't being discharged because of uh, our lack of, or our inability at some point to meet the needs uh, once they're out. I mean, obviously, um, it's, it's a vitally important issue in relation to emails and, and, and things going out to our staff saying that uh, in, in a particular area we've got a problem. And uh, I, I would appreciate, um, you know, sort of... Uh, if, if, if that's the case and it happens on a regular basis, then that means we've got a really serious problem that we need to, uh, you know, grasp the nettle and, and, and try and alleviate it. Uh, so, um, I mean, further down the agenda, I think I'll be uh, uh, bringing uh, a recommend or asking the committee to recommend that we do get a report on such such topics on the work programme. <laughs> but in saying that, thanks for your indulgence. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Uh, last person indicated to speak, Councillor Barnfather. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, I mean, it's quite right that uh, as an organisation with tasked with the responsibilities that we have to older and more vulnerable people that uh, we make sure that we have a resilience contingency in place. I understand that uh, that is what we are seeking to do. Uh, in terms of recruiting staff, 
it's always going to be difficult to get, recruit staff for uh, social care when you can go to Amazon and, uh, and be paid considerably more per hour stacking shelves or emptying shelves into baskets than you can by looking after uh, you know, the more vulnerable members of society. And I'm not sure that that's uh, something that we're capable in this chamber of being able to resolve. And it, you know, it's just, it is just an issue. Uh, just in relation to why we're sat here today, we're sat here today because legislation says we have to be sat here today. Uh, my understanding is it requires primary legislation to actually change that. That isn't something that can be done overnight. The government have been criticised in the past for being slow to respond to the developing pandemic uh, emergency as, as it has in fact come in different waves. We were criticised right at the beginning for being slow to react. Uh, the government have been very quick to react on this occasion and maybe the Prime Minister has reacted before the, uh, the uh, civil service can, can actually follow the lead. But you actually have to have a decision which generates action. You can't have an action that generates a decision. So the Prime Minister has, has made his announcement of, uh, of what we need to do in terms of increasing the uh, amount of vaccinations. The machinery of government, the machinery of a national health service has to catch up with that announcement. My understanding is that there will be some changes that will occur around about Wednesday of this week in terms of that build-up of, of capacity and people being able to access those additional booster uh, jabs that the Prime Minister is advocating that we should all receive. If you're old like me, you're fortunate you've already had one. If you're younger, and, and I, you know, I put my daughters into that situation, I know they're very keen to get their booster jabs. So my understanding is that as this, this week progresses, as I say, the machinery of, of the NHS and, and, and government will actually catch up with the government's uh, an, announcements. Uh, and I, I know uh, from Sue, I think, dealt with it there, but in terms of the workforce, we're already working with universities to try and actually recruit from source effectively, whether it be children's social care workers or adult social care workers. So all these things are happening behind the scenes to be able to improve our ability to recruit, and not only to recruit, but to retain once we've recruited. Thank you, Councillor Barnfather, forever the voice of reason, yeah. Daddy of the House. I, I did actually have a teams meeting the other day with our with what, our first graduate who appeared on there, and it was great to see. Um, Councillor Carr, you have already, is it? It's just really to point out to Councillor Barnfather that we've got primary legislation going through this week to enable Plan B to go ahead, okay. but the Council's abilities to have virtual meetings isn't in it. And also, um, just to let you know that you know you, you're absolutely right that this this announcement was made without a lot of people knowing about it. And just it popped up about five minutes ago that the NHS testing website has run out of lateral flow tests, and that's what happens when there's no joined up thinking. Yeah, of course. So for me, uh, yeah, I listened to the news at lunchtime as well, and uh, it was made very clear in the news reports that I watched that uh, actually there are plenty of lateral flow yeah. tests available. Okay. So. Okay. Oh, Councillor Carlton. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, just turning back to the substance of this report, it is something that I warmly welcome, and I, I understand and fully appreciate the concerns uh, across the chamber um, that they're not. They're very well documented, not just on a local level, but certainly on a national level. Um, but if we could just take a step back for a second, I think we are now really starting to realise and appreciate that the role that social care plays in conjunction with the National Health Service. Certainly one of the un unintended consequences of this last 18 months through various lockdowns, national restrictions, is the pressures that have built up around the National Health Service, not just in relation to COVID, but into elective surgeries, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and certainly through this council, we have a statutory responsibility to enable, uh, or re-enable, should I say, um, that safe um, uh, departure from hospital, whether that be a temporary residential care or back into the home. Um, certainly with the conversations on a national level with uh, the white papers, um, you know, that there's successive governments that have ducked questions on this. Uh, we have finally got into that position where the nettle has been grasped. Do I think there's more work that has to be done? Yes. 
does this also highlight from this is one of my personal opinions to the sort of the integration between the national health service and adult social care i think there should be another white paper that's my personal view but certainly um you know from this authority's point of view we have a duty to respond this is why this paper is in front of you today and this is our bit to play in that thank you thank you councillor carlton okay um the recommendations have been moved and seconded. We're now moved to the vote. Can we have a show of hands, please? All in favour? Thank you. That's unanimous. Okay. Agenda item seven, adult safeguarding service review. Safeguarding referrals have increased 36% over the last two years and continue to rise. Positively, the additional temporary posts that the committee approved in July were quickly sourced and have successfully stabilised the adult team in the multi-agency safeguarding hub so that they are now able to triage all new work. The key initial themes and milestones of the current review of adult safeguarding are set out in the body of the report. The review aims that people are safer in, the col in, in control of their lives, able to access a appropriate services at the right time and are supported to live as independently as possible. The review is being supported by independent specialist expertise. In initial assessment shows that six temporary posts will be needed on a permanent basis to predicted ongoing rising demand and also to implement the review improvement plan. Additionally, the report recommends the establishment of a permanent group manager post to lead on adult safeguarding in order to enhance senior leadership capacity in this important area of work. I move the recommendation set, set out on page 34 of the, the agenda pack. Do I have a seconder, please? I'll second those, Chairman, and reserve the right to speak. Many thanks, Councillor Carlton. I'll hand over to Sue once again. Okay. Thank you, Chair. So just a couple of things to highlight. Um, referred, I referred in the previous report to the Department of Health National Winter Plan. One of the requirements within that plan is that um, local authorities have actions in place to manage increased demands with safeguarding for safeguarding, and that they do that as a department, but also with their with their partners. So we've already got actions well underway for this, this requirement because we've started um, our review of adult safeguarding and we've stabilised the multi-agency safeguarding hub. That's important because that means that all incoming work will be screened and can therefore be prioritised um, in a timely way. Um, so um, the reasons that we're asking for these posts to be permanent is um, that um, Basically, we know that, that the ongoing pressures within the workforce is, is, does give right to, rise to more quality issues uh, in services at times. And we know that we've still got um, a lot of demand from COVID, a delayed and new, new demand coming through. So um, hence the request is now to make the post permanent and then they will support embedding the improvement work. Um, and also the fact that we need some additional leadership um, the, the group manager post will work not just in the department to embed and sustain all this work, but will also be working with the Nottinghamshire Safeguarding Adult Board and partners on things like you know, proportionality and what all partners can do to help safeguard people when they're working with them so that um, we can sort of minimise some of the high levels of referrals by working with them more appropriately. Um, so I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Sue. I'll open it up now. I've got Councillor Fielding first. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I cer certainly welcome the service review on, on this and, and welcome the welcome the post. Uh, it's a very complex area, certainly, uh, and, and I have uh, experience as a daughter of, of a parent uh, having the dolls uh, in place and, and dolls reviewed. It's not just not knowing what safeguarding is going to come forth, and, and certainly I would ask, uh, why do we seem to have more than, than other, other places? But I know that when it comes, it is dealt with absolutely uh, professionally and, 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 and correctly. And, I, and as, as I say, it's, it's when you are depriving somebody else of their, of, their, of their liberty, it has to follow a proper process. And it is absolutely done so in this in in this in this county. 
and the people and the people that, that do it are, are highly professional. Um, it's it's something that we 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 must must do and ensure that it is um, done to the utmost ability. But as I say, I welcome the report. Uh, but but why do have we picked so much up in this this period? Do we think? Thank you. So well, I think well, one of the answers why do we have more is because the mash is so effective. I think. But I will hand over to Sue. Yes, the, the graph shows that whilst uh, that some of those referrals don't actually progress to a full um, safeguarding uh, uh, process. So that's the area that we need to work closely with partners is about things that could happen in a more timely way without it without the referrals coming in. So that's we still have we still our demand for full safeguarding investigation still continues and that full complex work, but we are seeing partners i think at times of pressure people think well the mash works so we'll send it to the mash and that will sort it so we have got some work to do um on making sure that everybody's doing what they can as, as the first point of contact so I, I think it's a bit of both there's a lot of real demand but some of it we can deal with in a more proportional way civil are we keeping pace with the review of dolls, though, as I say, because that was, was a pressure at one time that, that not only had we got uh, further dolls coming in, but it was, it was timely reviewing uh, the, the ones that were, uh, were in. Just for new members, the dolls is deprivation of liberty, so it's OK, just for, yeah, just for clarity. So with do deprivation of liberty safeguards, obviously, um, when during COVID and people couldn't go into care homes and hospitals and it was quite difficult um, to do to do some of the work at that point um, we, we we didn't have many people waiting and so we did build up some a little a bit of a, of a list of people waiting but um, the services put in an action plan we work closely with um, one of our agency providers um, to get that back on track over the next six months um, and there is, we are waiting from the government new legislation around liberty protection safeguards as well that will replace dolls, uh, which was one of the reasons why it was good. We wanted to get back into, into uh, having very small numbers of people waiting because that will place us in a good position when we shift into the new legislation. Councillor Martin. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I'm happy to support um, additional staff to meet the extra demand. Obviously, we've talked about recruiting. Uh, the increase in assessing this service is, uh, is a concern. Edge UK have said abuse and neglect may have thrived behind closed doors throughout periods of lockdown, contributing to a stark national rise in the numbers of concerns flagged between April 20 and March this year. Nearly half a million safeguarding issues were flagged that year, up 5% from 1920 with the uh, very elderly, those aged over 85, most likely to be the subject of that concern. What are we doing as a council to ensure the public remains alert to adult safeguarding? And what communication could we p potentially do through social media and guidance for professionals via our website? You know, um, I was at the Health and Wellbeing Board the other week and, and they, they've come up with a new uh, website which is aimed directly at kids, health for kids. Perhaps we ought to have something more comprehensive and up to date for adults because it really is a big issue and I think technology might help raise awareness of it. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Yeah, it's, a, it's a really good point and um, it's, it's, that will come out of the review. It will be part, part of ensuring that there is this sort of proportionate response and people and the public know you know what action to take have they got concerns one of the one of the key drivers of, of increased safeguarding is when people aren't linked into wider communities people they can't see people they maybe can't see friends etc um, so covid obviously created that that situation you know um, as people were at home uh, we didn't have people going in and out of services like we normally did so um so those aspects are really important and we know that the research shows that so in terms of messages to the public and partners that will be part of the actions from the review thank you c 
Yeah, the, the MASH is the envy of other authorities outside of outside of us. Is that your hand up? Yeah. Cool. Bring me in, sorry. I know everybody's in a hurry to get back. But, uh, uh, yeah, welcome to the report. But in relation to the uh, paragraph 19, transforming King, I mean, we all, most of us all, everybody should remember what happened at Winterbourne View and uh, the, the national outcry that uh, ensued of our people uh, in these sorts of uh, units that should have been cared for were being abused terribly. And uh, moving on to the paragraph 20 in relation to the 30 transforming... Paul, Paul. Sorry? I'm coming round to a question. No, no, but you're on. You're on the next agenda item. Well, that's all right then. I'm just pre pre warning you. Thank okay. you. I just we might as well, yeah just. Yeah, let's stick to this one first. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so that's Councillor Carlton. You um, seconded and reserved your right to speak. Would you like to speak or was it? Uh, yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, obviously, committee will recall from our July meeting that uh, we provided extra resources uh, to the MASH team. Um, this is further step in the, the right direction. Obviously, the table uh, on page 30 uh, of this report or page 2 of this agenda pack uh, speaks for itself. Um, again, some of those unintended consequences of lockdowns, etc., um, have provided uh, um, additional pressures, that, that's fair to say. But also, I think it is fair to say that um, sort of the early detection reporting, um, encouraging stakeholders, whether it be through our place, district and borough councils, Nottinghamshire Police, Fire and Rescue, EMAS, and I can go on, uh, are putting those referrals in. Uh, I am uh, pleased to hear some of the comments around uh, sort of the right level of reporting. Does it really need to go into the MASH? Is there some little bit of work there that we can do? I think there is, um, but I think this really just speaks testament to, to the, the work that the MASH team do. Thank you, Scott. Okay. We will now move to the vote on the recommendations set out in the report. So I take a vote by show of hands. All those in favour? That's unanimous. Thank you. We'll now go on to agenda item eight, Councillor Henshaw. Okay, right. So it's changes to the staff. Yeah. Changes to the uh, staffing establishment in the living well services. For the past year, the Preparing for Adulthood PFA team has had two advanced social work practitioner posts. The team had identified a need for increased support with developing partnerships with external agencies and contributing to strategic discussion across children's and adult social care about the preparing for adulthood agenda. Having a second advanced social work practitioner post has greatly contributed to the ability of the team to engage with external partners and develop strategic objectives. The report proposes to retain these two posts in the permanent establishment of the team. The work also seeks approval to extend two temporary posts, advanced social work practitioner and forensic social worker within the Living Well Complex Lives team for an additional period of 12 months from April 2022. These posts are funded by external funding through the Transforming Care Partnership. This is from temporary monies, so committee approval is required each time it is provided. The funding has been extended until April 2023. I move the recommendations as set out on page 42 of the agenda pack and ask for a seconder. I'll second those, Chairman, and reserve the right to speak. Thank you very much. Um, I'm sure we've all read the report, but I'm going to hand over to Ainsley, the Service Director for Living Well. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. So, uh, firstly, as uh, Councillor Elliott mentioned, in order to retain uh, the two advanced social work practitioners within the uh, Preparing for Adulthood team, uh, we are proposing that we combine uh, two social work posts uh, in order to create uh, one full-time uh, advanced social work practitioner post uh, from January 2022, uh, which will uh, add uh, much needed uh, senior capacity and leadership to the team, uh, whilst also releasing uh, a small saving of just under uh, £8,000 a year. Uh, with regards to the posts within the Complex Lives team, uh, these are 
posts that are already in existence in the team um, and uh, as Councillor Elliott has already mentioned, they are funded by the uh, Transforming Care Grant. Um, however, we do need to seek committee approval year on year um, as the uh, grant funding is confirmed. Uh, and it now has been confirmed uh, for next year. Uh, therefore, we're seeking uh, to extend uh, those two posts for a further uh, 12 months. Happy to take any questions. Thank you, Ainsley. Thank you, Ainsley. I'll go to Councillor Henshaw so we can look at uh, paragraph yeah, 19. I'm not, I'm not, thanks, Jay. I'm not going to make any apologies for trying to outline the uh, national disgrace of what happened at Winterbourne View. And uh, many of us in this room, um, you know, uh, think that 10 years down the line, you know, things like that should be a, a, a thing of the past. But in relation to this particular um, report obviously it's welcome that we we uh, are looking at sort of the coalition the two roles to make it, it uh, more of a um, a role that could look at these uh, um, situations as outlined in para 20 uh, you know in relation to the people that are under the transforming patients uh, situation and uh, you know could, could i ask through you chair is is the uh, the introduction of this forensic sort of type of social worker uh, going to really help that situation thank you thank you paul when i, I was i was really interested in the forensic social care work and i had a discussion about it but working with the ministry of justice and looking at what their appetite for work is and what they do i found it and i think it will but Ainsley, do you want to So we already have forensic social workers uh, within the Complex Lives team. Uh, now, what their role is, lots of pe the people who would fall under the transforming care uh, heading, if you like, um, quite often have uh, offending behaviours which have taken them through uh, the uh, sort of uh, Ministry of Justice uh, and the forensic social workers uh, will work with those individuals, um, both in terms of their current uh, arrangements and current care, but also post-discharge uh, in terms of uh, making sure that they're in a setting where they're well supported and those risks and potentially uh, offending behaviours can, can be uh, managed better. Uh, so we do already have uh, those posts. Uh, they are really critical to this type of work because the people uh, that we're working with uh, within the complex lives teams uh, are incredibly complex. They're not people that can uh, easily be placed uh, in the community, uh, hence the fact that you know many of them have spent uh, you know, a long time uh, in hospital in some cases uh, because it is very difficult to place them uh, to, and place them successfully uh, because what we don't want is that we support people out of hospital into the community and then things go wrong and they find themselves uh, back in a hospital unit. Um, so the work of that team is is absolutely key uh, and you know all of the roles within the team are important uh, but as you quite rightly say the role of the forensic social worker um, is a critical role uh, within the complex lives team. Thank you Angela, thank you both for the question. Um, Councillor Carr. That um, preparing for adulthood is high, you know, is it's critical. Uh, it it is the point where you can lose all control of what you've done in the previous years, all the good work that you've done in the previous years. So uh, we will fully back the additional support that's outlined in this report. Thank you for that. I think yeah, preparing for adulthood is amazing, and complex, and uh, this this council now much more joined up way of thinking with the children's services, children, young people. Um, if someone does suffer with um, mental health issues or any other issues and they do have to come into contact with the council, it's not a surprise that they're going to be in contact with the council later on in life. So to have that conversation as early as possible and be that joined up. 
I've got Councillor Carlton did reserve his right to speak, so thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairman. And just to pick up on that point, um, certainly since joining this authority uh, in uh, May uh, to where we are now and since your um, uh, promotion to committee chair, um, Certainly, it's been very well noted um, that a lot of this key focus is down to yourself and also Councillor uh, Tracy Taylor, um, like you say, to join the, the dots and make sure that the various teams, departments across this authority are working uh, together. Um, uh, obviously, you probably have heard me uh, numerous times uh, mention mental health. It is one of my personal uh, passions, and I'll speak on it every opportunity. Uh, and certainly, in the course of this afternoon's debate, um, certainly before the pandemic, uh, during to where we are now over the last 20 months. Um, I was just wondering if officers could update um, the committee in the terms of what support is available uh, in respect of mental health. Um, as alluded to already, uh, making that transition um, is difficult enough. And uh, I just wanted those reassurances that the support is there. Thank you. So I think, um, you know, it's no surprise uh, you know, we've talked about mental health um, at length uh, in, in various meetings recently. Uh, the same level of demand that we're seeing in adults, uh, they're also seeing uh, through the CAM service. Um, I couldn't give you figures for that. We would need to go to uh, the, the Health Trust uh, for figures. Uh, but CAMS is very much, uh, you know, facing the same pressures and demands as adult mental health services. Um, I think generally uh, within Nottinghamshire uh, and mental health services, you know, we, ha we had pre-pandemic started a uh, piece of work to, to look at our community transformation. That work has continued, but probably at a slower pace than we would have liked. Um, and there obviously uh, needs to be a clear link with uh, services for for young people, not just uh, health services, but also there's uh, quite a good range of uh, voluntary sector support uh, for uh, young people uh, who are, you know, struggling with uh, their mental health. Uh, but I think uh, we need to really progress uh, that transformation work um, in the new year to, to really knit things together well. And obviously education plays uh, quite a big role in that. Uh, schools do report that, you know, the rate of uh, people that they're trying to support within uh, the school system uh, with mental health issues is, is high. Um, those are conversations that we have uh, quite regularly at the um, Special Educational uh, Needs Board, which is a, a multi-agency uh, group uh, where we do discuss how we can support one another as agencies uh, to, to have a much more coordinated approach. But it's, it's ongoing work, Councillor Carlton. Thank you, Ainsley, and thank you for the quote. Okay, we will now move to the vote on the recommendations set out in the report. We'll take the vote with a show of hands, all in favour? Again, that's unanimous, thank you. Okay, agenda item nine is the work programme. The recommendation of the report as set out on page 46 of the agenda pack is that the committee considers whether any amendments are required to the work programme. I formally move the recommendation. I'll second that, Chairman. Councillor Henshaw. Yeah, I mentioned earlier, you know, in relation to our debate on the uh, um, email that went out to staff and uh, the problem with the uh, meeting need in South Nottingham, which I think you mentioned, I just wondered if we could have something added to the work programme to look at this situation uh, in the future. I mean, uh, I'll crave your indulgence for that, Chair, but it's, it's something that's important for us all, I think, to be uh, informed of. Thank you. We'll have a look at it. It may be an operational issue for emergency planning, so it wouldn't come here. So, thank you. We could take a show of hands. Need to. Okay, thank you.